Good afternoon, good evening everyone. My name is Engen Eisen. I'm a professor of international politics at Queen Mary University of London as well as University of London Institute in Paris here. Uh, delighted to welcome you to this uh, evening's event. Um, we were already conducting a seminar with our um, guest speakers tonight, earlier in the afternoon with master students right across the uh, University of London Institute in Paris, and it was an intellectual feast, I must say, a wide-ranging intellectual feast of transnational politics and transnational law. Um, I will introduce them in the same order that they are sitting in here. Peter Brett here is um, a colleague at Queen Mary University in London. He's a lecturer of international um, politics. And um, Sarah Desilet is a um, lecturer in international politics and international law in Cardiff University. But she is also a visiting researcher or fellow in King's College. She has an affiliate position in Goethe Universität in Frankfurt and also a researcher in Monk uh, Global Affairs Program at the University of Toronto. And Lise uh, Damon is a uh, um, doctoral candidate at Makekere, um, I'm going to repeat that, Makekere yes. um, Institute of Social Research in Kampala, Uganda, and she works on law and labor. So all are going to approach it, the same issue of transnational politics of law, quite from different uh, angles. But particularly, Peter and Sarah have been working together as part of a Liverhume and British Academy project. Uh, so they're, what they're presenting is part of that project. Um, and they asked me to also mention that as part of a network that they have formed, that they were hoping to have uh, a colleague here from Burkina Faso, Asenia Sonda, but due to visa problems, couldn't be here. So without further ado, please welcome uh, our speakers and I look forward to it. Ah, how we are going to organize it. So I'm not going to come one after another to introduce each of you. So hopefully we'll do 15 minutes or so each of you and then we're going to have open discussion. Thank you. Right, thanks Engin. Um, I'm going to present my part of mine and Sarah's project and I'm only halfway through, but this is what I've got so far. Okay. Despite endless disputes about the details, there's widespread agreement that something like the judicialization of politics is a global phenomenon. That's to say that for the last 30 to 40 years or so, decision-making has moved globally out of informal, bureaucratic, and legislative arenas into the courtroom. Courts are now part of policy making, even on issues such as national security, electoral disputes, and even definitions of national identity, questions which would previously have been considered quintessentially political topics. For political science, and especially political science in North America, it's rather obvious what the, what the consequences of judicialization must be. Inevitably, and naturally, they argue, the corollary of the judicialization of politics must be the politicization of the judiciary. And I choose those adverbs from texts from Rand Herschel and Tom Ginsburg. This is because as courts rule on more and more domains, in more and more areas of activity, more and more organized groups will surely have an interest in knowing who those judges are ruling on their world and what they think. And for, Gin for Tom Ginsburg and Nuno Garupa, for example, this is why most of the world's jurisdictions now have the Judicial Council for selecting their judges. That is some mixed body where different social interests are represented. So it's no longer the case, as it used to be in Britain, that politicians alone would have the formal power of appointment. It's no longer, and it's no longer the case, as it used to be in Japan, that judges alone would have the, the power of appointment. Diverse interests must be represented in some kind of public process. 
Now, I think that approach is illuminating in many ways. And of course, it makes sense uh, for scholars who are familiar with the context of the United States. The, pro the prominence of the Supreme Court in, in the civil rights era in the 1960s led to a change in legal consciousness in the United States. And by 1980, judicial elections, for example, which had been around since the 19th century, had become real uh, hot points of political competition and increasingly expensive. So, as, as politics judicialized, interest in politicizing the judiciary increased. But I think it's obvious, even from those authors' own arguments, that such an approach struggles with jurisdictions where judiciaries, through maintaining certain social distance from society and thus protecting themselves from scrutiny, have managed to retain some kind of specific authority. Let me give an example of what I mean by that. The classic case is the United Kingdom in the later 20th century, where the appointment of judges and the judiciary itself was simply not the object of public scrutiny and political mobilization. Now, why was that? Classic answer says, between 1955 and 1987, it was even forbidden to judges uh, to talk in public on even the most controversial, least controversial issues, for example, on the radio. These are the famous Kilmura rules. And judges themselves were drawn from a particular elite of the legal profession, barristers, which was itself a particularly cloistered part, a particularly cloistered set of lawyers. Hazel, who was a barrister between 1973 and 1975 himself, wrote this about the world of barristers and where they came from. The bar, that is barristers, its geographical isolation within the inns of court is symptomatic of a wider social and professional isolation. Many never have lunch outside their inn. They have little knowledge of the world outside the temple. The ranks of the bar are drawn overwhelmingly from the middle and upper classes. They never shake hands when introduced, because in theory they know each other already. QCs not only wear different clothes, they sit in a different row. The little courtesies, may it please your lordship, I am much obliged, and the legal pronunciation of Latin are the equivalent of a sort of school slang, a private language. And of course, earlier shared Oxbridge education in particular, socialised political elites into a kind of respect for these conventions and their wider constitutional significance. <coughs> All of these mechanisms of social distance, I'm arguing, serve to make the kind of political scrutiny which political scientists assume to be natural or inevitable slower and less slower to emerge. So, when did the political, when did the old, the old boys network of judicial appointments start to change in Britain? Very late, and much later than the judicialization of politics. As late as 2005, indeed, the senior judiciary in Britain was formerly still appointed by the Lord Chancellor, i.e. a politician sitting in cabinet. And this was done through informal consultations, what they used to call soundings, with the bar, which, which of the old boys is best for the job. In 2003, in fact, the United Kingdom was even condemned by the Council of Europe for having a system of judicial appointments that made it more difficult to argue for formal judicial independence in the former states, in the states of old Eastern Europe without looking hypocritical. Now things have changed, very late. Uh, the whole process is more public, and there are serious efforts to stop the senior judiciary being pale and male. Even the Whigs are gone at the, United, the new Supreme Court. And rather more absurdly, did you know that the latest Chief Justice was actually advertised on Twitter, just in case any of you are interested in being Chief Justice? If all of that was obvious in late 20th century Britain, it's visible elsewhere too. In 1999, some of the most famous judges and theorists in Western jurisdictions, including Ronald Dworkin, the legal theorist, and Robert Badinter, who famously responsible for abolishing the death penalty in France, they met in Provence over some wine to discuss a paper by Ronald Dworkin on what was called the secular papacy. And in this discussion, which is transcribed so we can read it, they all expressed surprise at how judges were able to adjudicate questions of societal significance without suffering the same diminished prestige as religious, political, or business elites. They were surprised, in other words, at how little interest there was in actually who they were and what they thought when they were approaching these questions. And until very recently, at least, 
The British old boys me club method of choosing judges lived on in the empire, and I'm interested in Southern Africa. Under apartheid, South Africa itself was a classic case. The bar from which judges were also chosen throughout apartheid remained steadfastly attached to its apolitical self-image. It refused to countenance any public involvement in the selection of judges. And critics, indeed, would accuse the legal profession, often, of thus legitimising apartheid as a rule of law state. But as historians have told us more and more, South Africa itself was also an imperial power. In the small states surrounding South Africa, think Zimbabwe, Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, its hegemony in the legal field was just as marked, if not more so, than in the area of economics. I haven't got time to go into the details, but this is particularly obvious in the area of the senior judiciary. White South African judges were the most represented group on the courts of appeal in Swaziland and Lesotho and uh, Botswana throughout the Cold War period, throughout the apartheid period. In the 1970s and 1980s, the most prominent group of these South African lawyers on the Court of Appeal were relatively liberal lawyers from the jo uh, Johannesburg Bar, associated with Izzy Meisels and other judges who had refused to sit as judges in apartheid South Africa for, on political grounds. <laughs> and these judges would sit alongside other judges from Commonwealth jurisdictions, including from the Caribbean and West Africa. And these, other, these latter appointments, this is interesting, were themselves arranged for a different transnational old boys network, one in London through the Commonwealth Secretariat. They knew who judges were and they could tell you who to appoint, and they still do. By the 1990s, that network had been largely replaced by another network from the Cape Town Bar, one associated with Jan Steyn, who had also refused to sit as a judge eventually for political reasons. Soon judges like Pat Tebbett or Gerald Friedman, who when they retired as judges in South Africa, they would get phone calls from the Chief Justice in the Sutu, Swaziland of Botswana almost immediately upon their retirement. And they would travel for an interview to be appointed to the Court of Appeal. Sometimes, I've learned, these interviews would take place in Jan Steyn's office. And the whole interview would be rather strange. It would involve discussing a CV which everyone had already read. These were members of the same golf clubs, patrons of the same wildlife sanctuaries, and often holiday companions. Often remarkably, uh, remarkably to my mind, uh, Pat Tebbett was in fact still head of the Court of Appeal in Botswana at the age of 86 in 2010, when he was replaced by the first white Botswana judge. The first black Botswana judge to sit on the Court of Appeal in Botswana was not until 2012. That's when it finally becomes a permanent court and you start to get formal public appointment procedures. The case in Namibia is different but not entirely dissimilar. Between 1990 and 2008, only six permanent appointments were made to the Supreme Court. Um, acting judges largely staffed this court, and they were appointed informally through the same, largely the same means. A Zambian judge I spoke to recently, for example, um, was appointed in 1992 and still serves 25 years later with a break to go and serve to West Africa. And he was called the very same month after he had been forced out of his own bench for political reasons after the democratic transition. In all of those countries I mentioned, Lesotho, uh, Swaziland, uh, Botswana, um, when disciplinary hearings have involved the senior judiciary themselves, in every case, an entire slate of normally white South African judges has traveled to that country to try that judges on the Supreme Court. Okay. Right, so this is the old world of judicial appointments in South Africa. Recently, and unsurprisingly, these appointment mechanisms have come under varying degrees of pressure and I argue that this, these varying degrees and this variation can be explained by local and political, uh, political and economic conditions. Judicial selection has become a public question, in other words, for different reasons in different places. In South Africa, of course, the key date is the end of apartheid in 1994. And through an effort to restore public confidence in the judiciary, which is uh, drastically lacking, the whole process was opened up to the extent that uh, ju judges' interviews are now available on YouTube, and they are watched, and the, and the panel is made up by a very diverse set of interests, including civil society and NGOs, most of which are appointed by, uh, on the nod of the ANC, the political parties. That was South Africa. 
Botswana is a very different case. Judicial appointments have dramatically become a question of public importance since 2014, 2015. Dramatic series of court cases have brought this onto the front page of the newspaper. In one case, um, all expatriate judges on the, high on the Court of Appeal were ruled by the High Court to have been appointed illegally. In another case, uh, High Court judges who were suspended by their own Chief Justice accused the Chief Justice of witchcraft. And in yet another case, the Law Society of Botswana took the President to court, alleging that he was constitutionally obliged to appoint a judge who had been recommended to him by the Judicial Selection Commission. Now, in the Botswana case, there's a lot to say about this, but at least two things are going on here. And all of them are far more recent than the judicialization of politics, which supposedly, inevitably, and naturally leads to the politicization of the judiciary. First of all, and in stark contrast to Namibia, the legal profession in Botswana is relatively large, and black, and black lawyers represented by the Law Society of Botswana have, in particular, felt excluded from judicial office by the system of repeatedly appointing expatriates. In Namibia, in, uh, by contrast, the profession remains, although it's changing, divided on racial lines. The smaller Namibia Law Association has represented the interests of black lawyers, while the large Namibia Law Society, until very recently, was made up dominantly of white practitioners. That's one thing that's happening, and it's a contrast with Namibia. Another thing that's happened in Botswana very recently is that the paternalist developmentalist model of the ruling party which has been in charge for over 50 years, by the way, since 1966, has started to come under pressure by far the richest and most important union, the Manual Workers' Union. As late as the 1990s, the BDP conceded legitimacy to the very fact of organised labour for the first time. Throughout the first 30 years of Botswana's independence, it had argued successfully that it was simply unpatriotic to go on strike. By 2012, this had changed dramatically, in the mother of all strikes, as it was called, the country was paralysed um, for about eight weeks. Operations were cancelled, schools were shut down, and political, elite, political elites were scandalised by scurrilous songs and cartoons making fun of their appearance and speech. Of course, uh, the legal crackdown on the strikers was intense, and a series of follow-up cases sponsored by the Manual Workers' Union involved challenging the very appointment of white and expatriate judges in the Court of Appeal who ruled against them in the aftermath of the strike, and also involved challenging the suspension of the one High Court judge, Ki Dinganke, who had ruled in their favour. Okay, so this is being driven by something else to do with labour and the collapse of a developmentalist model. In Namibia, by contrast, uh, it is true that um, some senior judges, the most senior judges, have been accused of corruption. Some cases have been brought against them, and a few people have suggested that there was something wrong about their appointment. And once again, those people suggesting these things are opponents of the dominant party, which has been in charge for 27 years, and looks like little chance of fading. But unlike in Botswana, these opponents are marginal and under-resourced figures. In fact, it's probably not unfair to call them professional litigants, who were associated with the minuscule Workers' Revolutionary Party. It simply doesn't have the same cachet as in Botswana. So there's all kinds of variations in the local reasons why the old boys' network is broken down at different times, with different speeds in different ways. But what are the arguments deployed in all these contexts to achieve this change? Well, they're the same arguments that have been deployed to advocate gradual reform in Britain and dramatic changes in South Africa after apartheid. If leaving judicial appointments solely in the hands of politicians violates the old, norm of the old norm of judicial independence, then leaving appointments solely in the hands of an untransformed legal profession violates the new norms of judicial transparency and representation of society. I think there's a parallel here with the British government's claims to be both defending academic freedom and making academics accountable. This means that some form of public process centred around a judicial council representing mixed interests has always become the reformers' demands to reconcile these dual normative pressures. And in fact, even those political scientists I started with, who are very keen to discuss this topic solely in terms of interests rather than in terms of norms, even they concede that, these new or that some kind of orthodoxies are very powerful. Indeed, they complain in their books that uh, 
judicial councils are adopted far too often without inadequate evidence and by overlooking their own much better proposals. That suggests they matter somehow. So while local political conditions may account for the scope and timing of change, change itself is inexplicable without reference to the transnational diffusion of new forms of judicial authority originating in former metropoles of Britain and South Africa. <coughs> so in conclusion, while liberal political theorists of the mid 20th century looked to law as a source of authority for governing pluralist societies where more substantive authorities, be they moral, political or religious, appeared discredited, they looked to see, uh, uh, the senior judges on this view became something like the secular papacy. And the legal profession as a whole became something like Alistair MacIntyre calls the clergy of liberalism. Okay, this is what's going to make a pluralist society hang together, this thin thing of law, while that thick thing is gone. But contrary to the hopes of Dworkin and others who were gathered in Provence, the authority of the judiciary on a transnational scale has ultimately albeit very gradually, been eroded by the same pressures at work in society more broadly that have eroded the authority of other agencies. And whether that's a cause for sadness or celebration will obviously depend on your point of view. And that's it. So, good evening. I'm going to talk about another white and expatriate club, but coming from a different point of view. Uh, this one international, directly international, the International Criminal Court and the problem with the International Criminal Court that's arisen uh, since its very creation and entry into force in 2003. But come to, the problem has come to fruition in the last uh, few years, that is, is the ICC a tool of imperialism against African states? I've come to this particular story, and I've started with the idea of a white male's club, because I was asked, uh, and I particip participated to um, a project with another uh, colleague's, uh, colleague of ours, called Josephine Dawuni, uh, who set out uh, a project about African female judges operating in international courts. Her idea was that there are very, very few African female judges, but also the idea also was to look at the face of international justice. And to me, or to the question I'm going to bring you to in this presentation, looking at the face of the, the justice rendered by the International Criminal Court was a way to answer the question of, is it imperialistic or what do those judges represent? And what can this say about the justice that they render? For this project, therefore, I focused on one specific judge, a Malian judge called Fatoumata Dambele Diara. She was part of the historic bench of the ICC in 2003 and remained uh, on the bench of the ICC until uh, 2012. There have been so far 14 women judges at the ICC since 2003. This is comparatively speaking, a pretty high number when you compare it to the number of women at the International Court of Justice since its creation in 1945. As you may know, the International Court of Justice is um, the, the tribunal of the UN, so it's basically the World Court. There have been two since 1945. So the ICJ remains very much a white male's club for different reasons. The ICC has changed that a little bit. However, the profile, the trajectory of Judge Fatoumata Dembele Diara still lends itself to the idea of a trailblazer, that she is indeed exceptional. She was born in what was still a, a French colony, Mali, in 1949. Uh, she was the eldest of nine children. She managed to pursue a very pretty high level education in a country where girls still are deprived of education. She got scholarships to study law in Paris, um, mostly in Paris and in Bordeaux, and a little bit in the US. And she entered the judiciary in Mali and ended up at the ICC in 2003. The question, though, that arises from her career is that must women reach 
the exceptional to reach the ICC and beyond to reach transnational legal fields? And second question, what does the representativeness of women and with them African women and African lawyers tell us about the court and its authority and legitimacy over time? The takeaway message from this presentation, before I get carried away and forget it, is that biography can be used as an entry point to trace structural change. So my presentation is going to be a little bit about both, about method, about research agenda or setting a research agenda and some empirical conclusions from this specific case study. So biography can be used as an entry point to trace structural change at two levels. The first one is in the relationship between law and politics at the national level. And here I'm talking about the trajectory of the state. The position of lawyers, and of course here we're talking about a specific kind of lawyer, it's an elite lawyer. The position of an elite lawyer in the field of state power of a particular state can help us understand how the structure of power has evolved over time. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect is Obviously, this particular judge has had an extremely internationalized career. So the international has played a role in her career, but her patterns of internationalization, in other words, her path to the International Criminal Court, can also help us understand Mali's uneven and unequal connection to the world over time. In other words, it can be a clue to understand power relations between the global north and the global south. So let me unpack these two propositions. Methodological caveat, uh, or caveat, I never know how to say that, uh, first of all. To replace Diara's professional trajectory between her own subjective choices and wider structural conditions, there are two traps that may need to be avoided. The first one is what Bourdieu, the, the French sociologist, called the biographical illusion. That is the tendency that readers or even commentators or commentators ourselves on our own life would tend to draw um, individual stories as longitudinal, linear, and logical succession of events. This is partly true, but it's only one truth among many others. Bourdieu's suggestion is rather that it is necessary to construct a trajectory as a series of positions that are successively occupied by the same agent or the same group within a space that is itself constantly evolving and subject to incessant transformations. That is, within a biography itself, agency and structure are irretrievably linked. The second caveat is what can be called the interpretive trap. Of course, Peter has used interviews in his research. Uh, I'm sure Lisa uses interviews as well. I use interviews as my main method of gain, gaining some truth about uh, social matters and about social change. Interviewing someone who is still alive and who has a great level of reflexivity about her own life and of course, legitimately, legitimately, so can be extremely difficult because it means that she has the ultimate interpretive authority over what her uh, trajectory is and has been until now. But the trap can also be more insidious. It could be to read her life as a success story, which it very much is, because she went from a peasant background to the ICC. But is it that reading also a success according to the common script of globalization? That is, success according to what we, Global North, view as success, basically. But that's only a question I'm, I'm, I'm raising. There are also two theoretical problems. And this is where we come from uh, with Peter in our, in our common project on um, on the judiciaries and uh, judicial politics across the African continent. The first problem is the problem with lawyers. 
and we've touched upon it a little bit in the seminar earlier. The problem with lawyers is sometimes that the law seems like this warm and stuffy bubble that nobody wants to touch or open and better left to lawyers themselves. And that's a common problem in political science, that there is, in French you say an aveuglement, that you just, a blindedness to what the law is or a fear of unpacking what the law is. But this problem is rendered all the more acute and ideologically so in the case of Africa. Because there's a common image that's still prevalent in the media and in scholarship alike that Africa is a philanthropy play, that Africa is actually one big country in which there's the same phenomenon. And that phenomenon has been a failed colonial legacy, that colonialism was bad, but it has also failed, paradoxically enough. So a, conund a conundrum whereby you have underdevelopment, a devaluation of state elites, resource curse, and so forth, where the law is seen as both a solution and a problem, where reforms are forever brought about by international financial institutions, for instance, where work corruption of the judiciary is forever brought about as a problem. Lawyers themselves, but that's a common problem with lawyers, are in Africa, across the African continent, to stop using the term Africa, across the African continent, remain by far and by large a knowledge gap. There's very little known about legal professions. And like any place else, there's a tendency, whenever there is something known, to either see lawyers as mercenaries of imperialistic interests or missionaries of the rule of law. So that's the problem with lawyers. Second problem is the problem with international courts. And again, it goes back to some of our discussions earlier. There's a tendency to look at international tribunals as if they were tribunals. Of course, that's true. But is the law that they produce really the same as the law, that is the packaging, that is produced at the domestic level? Particularly in the case of debates about the ICC, there is a tendency to have a static position between law and politics, a constant oscillation between the crisis or the problem of a judicialization of politics and the risk or the trap in which the ICC is constantly falling or seem to be falling of a politicization of law. So how to go beyond that? Ta-da! <laughs> Twofold research agenda. And this is what we've set out in, in different places. But a twofold research agenda that I'm giving, it, giving to you as a suggestion, a proposition. The first one is to look at lawyers as themselves bearers of structural change, bearers of transformations of sovereignty. To look at lawyers as builders of the state and brokers of sovereignty. It's a story that's actually very old. It's one that's part of the fabric of the United Kingdom. It's one that's very much part of the fabric of France. You know the expression, le roi est mort, vive le roi, or long live the queen or the king. Basically, that there's a separation or distinction between the physical body of the king and the ethereal body of the state. This was studied in particular by a great researcher called Ernst Kantorowicz who showed that lawyers were by essence close to power because they were the condition of the construction over time of the legitimacy of power. But, this, but to do this, they also had to play a kind of tango dance with power. They had to distance themselves from politics because otherwise they would simply be swallowed by power and there, would not be, there wouldn't be any autonomy. This condition, this tango dance, is the very condition for the autonomy of the law and the autonomy of judiciaries. Otherwise, you don't have any civil system or any rule of law that actually functions. But it's a kind of uh, troublesome or ambiguous uh, tango dance. In the case of um, former African colonies, and in that sense, colonialism is an essential 
term to understand, to unpack, an essential period also to understand. These contradictory positions of all, both closeness to power and remoteness were favored by imperial and post-colonial realms. Why? Because the law enabled an economy of violence and favored also the possibility of legitimacy. But it also positioned lawyers as both collaborators and intermediaries of powers. Two researchers called Pew and Guamanam, who have studied the case of Nigeria, talked in particular of lawyers as the Frankensteins of imperial creation. This leads, or at least this dimension of a research agenda, leads to looking at trajectories or biographies of legal elites, not on multiple or overlapping scales, that is, in Mali and then in The Hague or in Paris, but to speak of interlegality, to look at their trajectory as having sediments of all these places at the same time. Second arm of this research agenda is a little bit more straightforward in a way, is to look at international courts not as physical buildings, but as symbolical and physical transnational arenas, as sites where the international and the national interweave, where you have projections of national interests and also projection of international universalization principles. There's been a body of research very recently that's been brought about by the crisis of judiciaries all over the place, basically the crisis of the judicialization of politics, but also much, in a way, much closer to some of our own interests, the power of international arbiters in particular, or international lawyers and the role they play in dealing with massive contests between states and corporations that sometimes deal with sovereign matters, but sometimes deal with our day-to-day -day life. In some countries, it's even access to water, for instance. So why those people, why those men, because they're mostly men, would they be entitled to deal with those disputes and with what kind of legitimacy? So there's been a body recently of research that's looked at their characteristics as a way of saying, the more we know about where they come from, the more we know about what assets they bring into the resolution of the conflicts that they deal with. The more we know um, then about the legitimacy of what they do. So beyond this proposition for a research agenda, looking at lawyers as builders of the state and intermediaries of globalization and international dispute resolution mechanisms as transnational arenas. This has led me, on the basis of an interview with Judge Patumata um, Dembele Diara and wider research on the ICC and judges um, at the ICC since 2003, at two series of conclusions. The first one pertains to the position of lawyers in the trajectory of the state of Mali. I won't go too much into the details of that. It's all in the chapter that I've written, so I'll very gladly distribute and circulate it. But there are two elements that are extremely interesting in her trajectory and that can be illustrated in other lawyers or internationalized lawyers um, of, of a similar uh, similar origins in a way, uh, all over or coming from all over the African continent. The first one is that Mali has gone through a series of military regime and has, as you may all know, is still uh, in the grip of a pretty violent war, but has been democratized to some extent. Contrary to all other former French colonies, Mali severed the ties that it had with France pretty early on, under its first president. And this had a pretty interesting consequence in terms of the legal system. You may think of independence as a break in time, as a moment where everything is going to change, as basically a revolution. But just like the term revolution, it boomerangs back, right? You can't build everything from scratch. 
all over the African continent and former African colonies, judicial and legal decolonization sometimes took 20, 30 years. Sometimes it was never achieved. In the case of Mali, it was achieved pretty rapidly, basically because French judges, French magistrates, that were part, basically, of um, the, the business of colonialism, left the country abruptly. But it still didn't mean that the legal system completely changed. It was still, it still mirrored the French legal system, and also meant that all the lawyers that you could call the legal lawyers of the Malian regime up until now still got their credentials by going to France, by studying in, at the Sorbonne, by going to the ENM, which is the École Nationale de la Magistrature, and so <coughs> forth. That's the first element. Second element is that because it was a military regime and it navigated and it oscillated between a little bit of opening up and then closing down, lawyers had constantly, and this was the case of uh, Judge Diara, had to navigate the tightrope of opposition or ambiguous cooptation. Even Diara was close enough to the regime that she could still get a job, basically, throughout her career, extremely close to the center of power, but autonomous enough to retain her own legitimacy. So how did she retain that legitimacy? One possible hypothesis or answer is the international as an asset, that she had international networks, that she was part, that she was herself a human rights um, advocate for the rights of, of women and children, and doing that, she had networks all over the world, and particularly in the US, which didn't mean that she was so much protected at the domestic level, but it meant that she had a path to the international, and she could then come back to domestic level. Second conclusion, um, empirical conclusion, is about African women judges at the ICC. I've mentioned that there have been 14 uh, women since 2003, among which there have been five African women. It doesn't seem that much. Uh, African states represent the biggest regional group um, of the Assembly of State Party to the ICC, which means that the, if ever the African Union decided en bloc to leave the ICC, there would be no court anymore. It's just unfeasible. Um, but what's interesting, though, is that there have been five women out of the eight African judges that have been elected to the court, which makes act actually the African women contingent among African judges extremely large. This will be my last sentence. Um, it raises a kind of interesting question. We are in a situation of apparent backlash by African states against the ICC. I say average because there's no actually a real consensus uh, among African Union states. And Burundi is thus far the only state to have actually pulled out um, of the Rome Statute. But why have so many women been nominated? A cynical answer would be that states do not care that much about the ICC. A less cynical, but still very cynical answer would be that they've been pressured to do so because all the women that are judges at the ICC have a specific profile. They're advocates for women, they're advocates for children's rights. They really correspond to something that is pushed by the international donor community. Or else, well, I leave it at that and I'll stop there. <laughs> Okay, I'm, my talk is going to change the register slightly from actually talking about law to a transnational practice of migration in the Great Lakes region. And there are encounters with law that come up between migrants themselves with national and international law and, and the scholars of migration having to discuss law and how it interacts with migrants. Um, but first, I wanted to sort of situate a kind of politics of discussing this question of migration, since it's 
such a political issue. Um, just to point to the difference from how the politics are determined from where, where you're discussing the matter from. Um, I had a dinner on Sunday night with a friend of mine who has spent 10 years in the region and who worked on, on migrants in Burundi, Rwanda, and Uganda. Um, and she's just moved back here and she's taken up uh, trying to, she's a photographer, trying to find the right way to discuss migrants crossing the Mediterranean. So she's now on a ship in the Mediterranean taking pictures. Um, and she, she had shifted registers um, six months ago. She was, we were in Kampala discussing how the major issue of migrants in, in that region was to try and humanize their lives by de-dramatizing them. Um, now she's here and she's taken up the politics of dramatizing their lives to get through a certain callousness of residents of Europe in relation to these migrant lives. So I'm still in Kampala, <laughs> so I'm still discussing the issue of migration and trying to counter uh, a local NGO state discussion about migrants in the, in the area. And so for me, that means getting away from the idea of the horror of their experiences um, and to, to discuss their decisions to migrate in relation to, the, to complex desires and not only in relation to colonial exaction, exactions in the time of in the colonial era and not only to post-colonial violence in the post-colonial era, um, but to a multitude of different life circumstances. So, I mentioned the NGO discourses in, 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 in Kampala. Um, they have fundraising and awareness raising priorities, which means they have to blow up the issue of migrants. Um, and they focus on the immiseration and subhuman existences they focus, they focus on camps and lack of choice. Um, and when you speak specifically of the, the Barundi and Banyarwanda experience of migration in that area, the, the genocide, ethnic conflict, all of that adds to a kind of a, a way of approaching the question that, that darkens the story. Um, so for me, the opportunity that this particular trajectory of migration of Barundi's affords is to understand transnational travel back and forth in its variety, um, in a long durée perspective, and thus to try to unsettle the usual categories that knowledge producing institutions come up with to speak about who these travelers are, what they're up to, and what to do about it. So there are two strands to the story. Um, people disappearing from the institutional effort to categorize or name them, and people disappearing from their own settled lives to try something else out. I'll start with the first strand of the story because that situates us as researchers and academics whose job it is to collect, articulate, and theoretically frame the lives and practices constituted by the, extra, the actors of the second strand of the story. So I'm at Miser, Makerere Institute of Social Research, um, and Miser has produced two full-length studies about the migration of Burundi and Rwanda, of what Burundians and Rwandans to Uganda. Um, uh, one in the one in the fifties, so still in the colonial era. One in the nineties. Um, so Makerere Institute of Social Research was opened in 1948, and it was first called the East African Institute of Social Research. And it was modeled on the Rhodes Livingston Institute, um, which basically meant to provide knowledge about tribes and societies across the British colonial territories in a post-war effort to maintain control over populations, just as the empire was disintegrating. It's situated in Makerere University, which was first opened as a technical school in 1921 to provide colonial education for natives. It was amongst the apparatuses put in place as a last-ditch effort to maintain British hegemony, if not by a colonial rule, at least in terms of knowledge production. So from the start, the fate of 
the institute and its direction was completely linked to the directors that it had. Its second director um, is Audrey Richards, who was a Cambridge-based functionalist anthropologist. And she really set, it, set the tone for about 20 years. Um, she and her team were all about the primacy of the field. So during her six years tenure, she, she saw her job as, as training anthropologists and keeping them out in the field as much as possible. So keeping them away from Kampala. Um, and some people have described her, her reign as director as a sort of cult of Malinowski. Um, in any case, the place was still a colonial institute um, with colonial, the colonial administration, administration commandeering studies. So one of these was a study of labor migrants from the Belgian territories of Wanda Wundi, which were administered together by the Belgians. Um, so the explicit questions they were asking were, how did they come? How did they integrate or not? And what are the effects of their presence on Baganda society? The implicit questions that come out in the interview notes, which is there's a big section of the book that are interview notes um, in Annex, was all, they're, they're seeing all this potential labor crossing the border, but then they seem to be disappearing into Baganda life. So what's, where, where is this labor? And it was a concern both of the of the, well, of the Asians and the, the European factory owners and, and, and plantation owners, but also of the Baganda landlords who had cotton fields and who, who needed the labor. So there's this constant sense of the urgency of, 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 of labor that you see crossing borders, but that you don't really see materializing enough as laborers. Um, so the first set of questions are explicitly answered via observation at border crossing points and interviews with Barundi migrants and Baganda peasants and landlords. And the second set is not so much answered as specified. And this is where the question of the law and its capacity or not to control populations by naming or categorizing them becomes salient. So in order to distinguish an immigrant from a native under the law, there has to be some sort of territorialization of the concept. Um, but when there are multiple coexisting concepts of nativeness under the law, things get a little tricky. The problem at this point in time is that there were two types of native. There's the protectorate native and the African native. Um, and thus there were also two types of foreigners. There's the African foreigner and the non-African foreigner. Um, and this causes a lot of confusion in their discussion of political incorporation options for, for immigrants. Uh, so in the study, there's three versions of the problem that come up. The first, the first appearance of the term native is in a discussion of alien land ownership, whether it's possible or not. In the Buganda Land Law of 1908, it says that the consent of the governor and the Buganda parliament is necessary to sell land to non-natives. To explain this, Richards reads back into it a definition of native found in an ordinance of 1945, which calls a native any person who is a member of, or anyone whose parent is or was a member of an indigenous African tribe or community. Indigenous here presumably means of the protectorate, but it's not clear as the following discussion shows. It seems that the non-native of the 1908 land law referred to non-Africans, since the Baganda Parliament passed a resolution in December 1951 that the land law of 1908 should be amended to read, the landlord will not be permitted to sell land to anyone who is not a Muganda, in lieu of to one who is not of the protectorate. And this actually points to a third, more constricted definition of native as of Uganda, which is only one of the several kingdoms of Uganda. Um, the second time the definition of the term native comes up is regarding political incorporation via local councils that were established in 1951. And it's unclear, even in the law, whether participation was based on indigeneity or residence. Thus, although immigrants did participate, according to Richards, this did not mean they were legally considered natives to protectorate or Buganda law. 
And the third time it comes up is in a section written by Mukwaya, who was one of the researchers trained by <coughs> Richard, on the criminality of immigrants. And he writes, the laws of the protectorate are definite on this question of immigrants living in Uganda. An immigrant is subject to the local chiefs and the Buganda courts as soon as he arrives in the country. This is because every native is subject to the local authorities, and the term native, as defined by the protectorate ordinance, includes any person whose tribe is a tribe of the Sudan, the Belgian Congo, or Rwanda Urundi, the protectorate or the colony of Kenya, the Tanganyika territory, Nyasa land, and includes the Swahili. This last definition tends to resolve the issue of whether or not resident labor immigrants could be represented in the local councils, as these were part of the native authority bureaucracy, which, was, which territorialized the tribes. Some scholars see this native problematic in a wider context of, the, of a politics of indigeneity, subscribed to by the British protectorate. British definitions of indigeneity depended over time on how threatened their role, their role was. So until the Baganda and immigrants actually joined forces against landlord exactions in the 40s, an immigrant was to all intents and purposes a native in the eyes of the state. Then British support for a nationalist Baganda movement called the Kabaka Yenka was an attempt to break the coalition and make a political distinction between who was native and who was not. The confusion around nativeness is, of course, steeped in confusion around the delineations and definitions of what is meant by ethnicity, tribe, caste, class, status, and occupation, which occurs throughout the literature on the region. So it seems concepts of nativeness and foreignness can only be understood in relation to a history of power and its institutional reasonings. Um, and although the discussions of nativ nativeness under the law are almost footnotes to the Richard study itself, it seems to offer one angle to answer the question about where all these immigrants have ended up. The ones that she and her team of anthropologists describe with an, Im an image reminiscent of World War II refugees in Europe, walking single file along the roads, destitute and disheveled, disappear within the legal category of native, because those defining legal categories at the time were were more concerned with distinguishing black from white, African from non-African, so the Banundi were often considered quite native before the law. The second study, so now I'm fast forwarding to 1990s, early 90s, um, was again commissioned by the state, the post-colonial state, and produced by the institute. Um, at this time, the credentials of anthropology had been seriously undermined as a colonial science, and with attempts at Africanizing knowledge came a shift to sociology and its methods from the late 60s. The institute had been renamed the Makerere Institute of Social Research, and its research agenda had been nationalized, meaning the research field grew tighter and tighter, and its geographical range closer and closer to Makerere itself. By the time the author of this study, Gingera Pinchwa, became director of Miser, Several directors had resigned because of the lack of autonomy of Miser in relation to Makerere and the state. As one writer put it, Miser had no local consumers of academic research products, not even Makerere University. The study itself was produced in the early 90s after structural adjustment programs and privatization had turned Miser into a consultancy hub. And the problem of Miser's relevance had been solved by producing widely circulated reports for donors, NGOs, and the state. So in terms of its language and scope, the second study awkwardly straddles the worlds of policymaking and descriptive analysis. The title of this study is Uganda and the Problem of Refugees, and it covers the cases of Sudanese and Congolese refugees, Uganda's own production of refugees, and the case of interest to me, the Banyarwanda. So this term, Banyarwanda, is a kind of throwback to the colonial era, uh, referring as it does to people from the Belgian colonial and colonially administered kingdoms of Rwanda Urundi together. But it is still very much in use today, and Barundi migrants are still subsumed within the category of Banyarwanda, um, in both studies and day-to-day -day talk. This is yet another category, like that of the native earlier, in which the specificity of a Barundi migrant life experience kind of disappears. 
What is striking in this study is that the migrant native dichotomy has been completely replaced by a citizen refugee. What? And the legal discussion turns around to what extent Uganda's refugee law complies with international refugee law, and to what extent both of these are enforced in practice. Ethnographic methods more or less disappear, except for one study of Banyarwanda refugee li living conditions within one of the camps. And the major implicit question driving the study seems to be why were so many Banyarwanda living in Uganda for generations joining the Rwanda Patriotic Front in their long march back to Rwanda? Um, in 1993, when the study was produced, there was heated public debate over a report which recommended the naturalization of all Banyarwanda refugees, a promise made by Museveni to those who had joined him in the NRM guerrilla war to seize power in 1986. There was also debate over whether Kinyarwanda and Urufumbira languages should be allowed on state radio. Museveni ended up withdrawing the naturalization offer because it caused too much political strife with his political uh, adversaries. But the main issue for those Banyarwanda living in Uganda was their subsumption under the category of refugee Whereas many were nationals from as early as when the colonial boundaries were drawn, others were semi-nationals whose parents had come as labor migrants and settled in Uganda, and a whole slew of others were post-colonial migrants, perhaps refugees in their day-to-day -day experience of living in Uganda, but were not officially registered refugees, either with the UNHCR or the Ugandan state, often because under both international and Ugandan law, Registering as a refugee meant having to live where the state told them to live, usually in settlements or camps. And although this was not necessarily enforced in practice, there was also always the possibility that it might be, since such was the law. What comes out of the study is a sense of the ad hocism of Uganda's refugee policies, which appears quite similar to the colonial government's flip-flopping over definitions of nativeness. A fairly close link can be made between the political fears and aims of the different political regimes since independence and the legal definitions of refugees they produced, their desire to comply or not with UNHCR regulations, and the efforts or not made to enforce refugee law. Now I'm going to flash forward to the present. Here I am, a PhD fellow at Miser, and I'll end with this set of stories. Participating in the current director's attempt to bring the production of knowledge about Africa back to the African continent by turning Miser into a teaching institute as well as a research institute and attracting enough funding so that scholars would decide to stay there rather than go to US or European institutions. There's no government body that has commissioned my study of the Burundi migrants in Buganda, but I have been urged in many ways to join specific research groups that deal with contemporary issues of interest to the state, such as land grabbing and sorting out the effects of a convoluted law on land tenure on residents of Uganda. And we've recently been reminded by the director that Miser is the foremost research institute in Uganda, so we had better get on it. Mm -hmm. In a sense, we could see the politics of Miser at present as a conflation of the two earlier moments discussed. The onus is back on serious immersion in the field to counter the consultancy culture. But in order to justify this move to both the Ugandan state and the greater Makerere University bureaucracy, we're urged to produce knowledge relevant to both the state and the university. Recently, the state and international organizations are presenting Uganda as the foremost refugee host country in the region. The figure is something like two million refugees at this point, registered refugees. Um, but as I said earlier, my interest in Burundi migrants is to think through the stories of travel and displacement which do not fit the post-colonial refugee or colonial labor migrant categories. To finish up, um, I'll just say a few things about three women that I interviewed last year for a pilot study on women migrant domestic labor in Kampala. The first is Maureen, who was my neighbor's nanny in the compound I lived in upon arriving in Kampala. Her grandparents had come in the early 40s after having participated in one of the many anti-colonial revolts that took place in eastern Burundi at the time. They were fairly well off, 
So this was not your typical case of needing to go work in neighboring British territories to make money to pay Belgian taxes. You might call them rather political exiles. In any case, they arrived, worked for, Bag for a Baganda landlord for a time, doing cotton picking, and were then given a plot of land to cultivate as their own. They were considered nationals from the moment of independence, though they didn't actually receive their ID cards until 2011. Uh, Maureen's mom came to Kampala in the 80s looking for work, and Maureen was born there in that same neighborhood from a Baganda father. And Maureen is the first person of her family to own a Ugandan passport, as she made the decision a year and a half ago to go to Oman and work as a nanny for an Oman family for three years. She's still there, making 10 times the salary she would have made in Kampala, and supporting much of her extended family on it. But in the meantime, her family's foreignness in Mitiana, where they live, has become apparent again through current attempts to streamline land law um, in Uganda. And so this, this issue of land, which is the way that they became invisible as foreign, is now the way that they are becoming visible again as foreign. Um, the second is Belize, who is a Burundian woman of 23, who had worked as a nanny for yet another neighbor of mine for about five years, and who now owns a small shop in a sort of semi-slum area of Kampala. And she was born in Rwanda from a Burundi family, moved to Burundi when she was eight, and then came to Kampala with her cousin's family when she was 11. Then came five years of hell for her as she became the cousin's family household slave before she managed to escape and find work with my neighbor's family. But from that moment on, she managed to save and began returning to Burundi and Honda regularly to visit family, which she continues to do as the proud owner of her own shop. And she told me mainly how easy it was to get and keep both travel documents for Burundi and Honda, and also the process of acquiring her Ugandan citizenship. She basically just had to pay a small sum to a local council member who vouched for her family history in one of the smaller Baganda clans. And she also took a Muslim name for her papers, Mariamo, another tactic that stops the authorities from potentially digging into early missionary and church documents for birth records. Hers was definitely not the story of a post-colonial refugee fleeing ethnic conflict at home. It rather shored up the ease of sustaining multiple belongings and navigating different national legal regimes. She both had a Ugandan ID card and a Barundi laissez passer And contrary to Maureen and her sisters, she spoke not only perfect Luganda, but also Kirundi, Kinyarwanda, and Swahili. The last story is of Desiree, who came in late 2015 with the family she was working with, who themselves were fleeing the post troisième mandat turmoil when Nkurunzinza, the Burundi president, began his campaign to present himself for another, for a third term. Her employers were upper middle class journalists who felt like they needed to weather the storm outside the country. She came along for the ride. They first went to Kigali for a few months, but were then given 48 hours to leave the country with no explanation, and they landed in Kampala. While her employer's family did not risk going back over the year and a half they lived in Kampala, Desiree made the trip back and forth many times to visit her family, with no Ugandan residency permit to speak of. All she needed to cross borders was her Burundian state-issued laissez passer her life in Kampala, contrary to the two previous cases, was very much cloistered within her, her employer's house and that Barundi community around them. There, so there are two ways in which Desiree disappeared from the life she was living in Kampala. The first was by narrating an imaginary life for herself to her family back home, to whom she said she was no longer working as a domestic laborer, but was running her own import-export business in the region. The second was by actually deciding to run away from her current employer, another upper middle class Barundi family for whom she was working since August. This second move to run away collapsed the first imaginary disappearing act as her em employers used their networks to find her back in Burundi and the whole story unraveled before family and friends as they had to scramble to find the money to pay back her debts. <laughs> 
One of the tropes that links these three stories of migrant lives in Uganda is the way they are punctuated by acts of disappearance and reappearance, literally, legally, and socially. It's also the way Burundi informants themselves, both to myself and in the few ethnographic studies produced in Burundi, amongst returnees from Uganda, refer to this particular migrant trajectory. They call it Kurobera, which means disappearing for a time. So, to finish, I don't know how successful I'll be, but I would like to try and disappear this project from the usual categories employed <laughs> to discuss migration on the African continent, while also problematizing the major framing question to which many political science and anthropological studies try to provide an answer which is basically, if the history of Africa from the 5th century onward is one of constant migration, then why are ethnic identities still so important? Well, thanks very much for all the um, uh, three presentations, three talks. I've really, really enjoyed and they just beautifully range from politics, law, and uh, knowledge, and the sites of production. And there's so much also conversation implicitly or explicitly going amongst the three. Um, I can say so much more, but I won't. I want to take some uh, questions from the floor. Um, I suggest that I take about um, a group of them, and then uh, let our speakers answer them. Yes. Um, I, I was fascinated by your first speaker that talked about the traditionalization of politics as a, a, a given that everyone, um, you know, as a given of this presentation. And it, it, it's a very striking idea as, a, as an overall trend. And I, I just wanted, I wondered if you could say a bit more about why you think, <coughs> why you think that is such a strong trend. And is it more marked, for example, in post-colonial societies than in uh, European societies. Thank you. Any other questions, Rupert? Um, you were talking about the ICRC and the sort of composed of the globally happening boycott of the ICRC by African states. There was a lot of talk of making an African uh, from the court. Um, I'm going to be following it too strongly. Is that going anywhere? Or is it, is it just sort of, is it died down? A lot, a lot of the anti ICR is obviously very, very politicized. But the, there's, uh, the there's a longer answer as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? I would like to uh, have one more. <laughs> Silence helps thinking. Maybe not. I have a question. I have several of them, but I will let you just actually respond to these two and then see where we go from there. Um, so I think people take it as a given too easily as if we know what we mean by that. But I still think it's real, the judicialization of politics. Um, Maybe I can clarify a bit. What it doesn't mean is that now the rule of law wins and politics loses, or something like that. Obviously not that. And I think the way I chose my formulation is to say that these things get decided in courtrooms so as to not make a judgment about whether what happens in the courtroom is in some way actually law or actually politics. I'm just trying to say it's not going to change in the arena. Um, if we want to see examples of how um, that's not just a Western thing, for example. Um, if we look up, um, some people in the room may not like this, but oh, it's okay. Um, if you look at what's happening in Zimbabwe today, there's a whole theater of legality about these things. And that's an important part of Zimbabwean politics. And um, a bit better, which I was hoping Antonia Somda could talk about, is what's happened in Burkina Faso. I don't know if there was a coup in 2014. And what you can't do is ever is to say this was, uh, that was a coup, and that's fine. There's a theatre of legality which has to be gone through. So this, um, we were doing a coup because the previous regime was unconstitutional, and then if we want to bar the old regime from running the elections, uh, we can bar those people who had unconstitutionally voted for the president to unconstitutionally extend his term. 
So it's not like it, okay. Now, I don't think that's, when I say theory of legality, I mean I don't think it's superficial or unimportant. I think it has all kinds of effects, not just on practical politics, but also on the imagination. So that's an example of how I do think it's a real thing, but it's not to say that this is about, we've moved into some kind of rule of law state or something like that. Um, and you can make similar points about you know, the war on terror or any of these things which are meant to be kind of backlashes in the Western point. It's not about that, this is something Sarah raised earlier. There's a whole theatre of legality again about this. It's not, this has to be done, this has to be justified by John Wu or whoever has legal. Yeah, well, thanks for your question. Um, so there have been indeed uh, talks and moves towards creating an African court for Africans, basically. Um, and they, within the remits of the African Union, so as a kind of alternative to the International Criminal Court, and through the uh, Protocol of Malibu in 2014, this, for the time being, has gone nowhere. So it is leading most commentators in the West, if we could say, uh, into saying that there, since there's no alternative to the ICC, so ICC International Criminal Court, um, this is basically what we're stuck with. With also the idea that there's basically the extremely problematic lack of consensus within the African Union, so like power struggles that keep evolving and, and moving, and that also it helps explain that. However, there's something still extremely interesting that's happening and that remains invisible if we only focus on the kind of ideological struggle between Africa and the ICC, is that the Protocol de Malabo of 2014 is extremely innovative in the sense that it doesn't just look at international crimes like the ICC statute, it also looks at a whole range of other crimes including abusive exploitation of resources. So in this day and age where carbon has become one of the most elusive resources in this current crisis of capitalism, where Africa is heralded as a kind of new Eldorado for new energies or new sources of energy and so forth, having a court that actually says, well, be careful, because we're going to investigate that. Well, that court doesn't exist yet, right? But it taps into a whole load of other dynamics that are happening at the moment, um, that involve um, contests over the distribution of natural resources at very different scales, um, be it international arbitration or between communities and whoever the local intermediaries of corporations are that they see. And some countries on the African continent are at the forefront of a war waged against Western justice, in a way, or Western um, conflict settlement mechanisms. And South Africa, uh, first and mostly, is not the only country, is one who, which has denounced, basically, investment treaties, so against arbitrations by the club of white grand old males who discuss and resolve disputes, and it's also South Africa that is at the forefront of discussing what the protocol of Malabo could look like. So I don't have any definitive answer, but I'm just saying, well, we have to keep looking because something is definitely happening. Thank you. Um, what's you just, just tag on there, something else you mentioned in the article in Quality Gap Against Are is that um, the old prosecutor himself is talking about expanding what international law is to include things like corruption. Moreno and Campbell. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I heard uh, two weeks ago a judge from the ICC uh, say in an academic context that um, yes, of course, the International Criminal Court should also make climate change a crime somehow in the environment and dem demography and so on. I mean, the, the, the boundaries are blurred between yeah. whose version of international criminal law is what. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the question of judicialization of, um, of, of politics, Elisa, your presentation also speaks to it, although you don't use the concept, so I just want to um, um, ask a question about to what extent, for example, the process that you have identified and process that you politicize on the question of labeling those people who move 
mm -hmm. the very um, concept, the very category of migrant and the negotiations between are they natives, are they foreigners? Um, to what extent you see also judicialization of politics playing a role in that in that process? So I'm assuming that much of that categorization is happening through also uh, legal field, uh, particularly the legal field of migration law. I wonder if you had observations about the construction of the ca those categories, exactly that fit into um, what Sarah and uh, Peter are talking about. I don't, I can't say much to it in terms of like the contemporary. Um, what is migration law? What is transnational mi migration law doing? Um, I can speak mainly to, and then it wouldn't be migration law, it's refugee law. Um, that's what comes up in the second study that I, I was talking about, where there's a constant, well, there's three negotiations going on. There's, there's international refugee law um, and UNHCR implementation. And then there's, there's, so there's a competition with the Ugandan state and that state, in the, in that period that they discuss it, changes several times. It's Obote, and then it's Amin, and then it's Obote again, and then it's Musiri. So each state has its own politics of whether they, it's important to them for refugees to be named as refugees and to comply with UNHCR um, categories and, and, and what you have to what you have to provide to refugees in, in your country. Um, there's that negotiation, and then there's the one with between actual refugees and whether or not it's a good idea to, to register as a refugee. Um, and what I don't know is the details of how that might change law. Um, there probably are some things to investigate in that level, but in terms of speaking to, to, to actual migrants, um, it, it, when it when it becomes use the moments that it becomes useful to claim refugee status is the moment when the politics of the government are against the migrants. Um, at that moment, it's safer to be under UNHCR law in camps, and in all in any other moment, it's really not a good idea to be in that camp situation in relation to the. The, the larger community in relation to, to the fact that they have, I mean, Burundians and Rwandans and Ugandans have multiple family links over generations from one place to the next, which is kind of what I like to shore up to undermine the category. Thanks. Anna Louise. I have a question that sort of follows on from that, and again, an attempt to sort of like straddle this. We've talked a lot about where we understand, you know, the types of law which are by we understand us through the international or potentially transnational lens. We talked, we talked to, in the seminar earlier as well about lawyers acting as kind of intermediaries in their distance but proximity to power. But I'm thinking, once again, of just throw into it a more, you know, a French example of um, migrant laborers. Um, again, in a situation of relative invisibility and using other, much more local forms of law, particularly around very basic things like the right to spaces for prayer, um, the right to forms of housing, the rights to forms of assembly. And so I'm thinking about that at times where there were very, where people didn't have voting rights and they, you know, they didn't have to have rights of movement and so on. Um, Algerian workers, particularly in France, let's say. Whether or not you're hearing in any of the interviews that you're conducting that type of mobilization of law, which is not international law, but which might be workers' rights within certain spaces, might be, or, or not at all. And, and what does that tell us about the, 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 the possibilities of law operating perhaps, you know, that intermediary position that we were talking about, it, but actually operating towards the ends of protection? Of my Thanks, um, Annalise. Uh, just before that, let me see if there are any other uh, questions. I, I think that maybe I would yep. kind of add to that question a little bit and have you unpack what you meant by invisible. And um, by that, it seems like a, a maybe tactic or strategy that people use 
But at what point is, is it, um, at what point are, are, is this, are these movements or these invisible people um, able to actually come together uh, to, for example, demand, demand rights of, of, of themselves or uh, seek recognition or, or do something like this, or even communicate? Um, Thanks, Jordan. Maybe you should just respond to those two. Okay. Um, let me start with the end of your question about communication. Um, first of all, the Kirundi, Kirundi language and the Luganda language are similar enough that you can get by and you can easily learn the other language. Um, how they find each other, there, there are sort of informal associations the Burundi in, in Kampala. Um, the, the two studies that I mentioned, they, they point to the fact that because of this like long durée perspective of this tra migrant trajectory, there are very, there are large networks of people who know who, who is where and where they came from and messages, well, back in the colonial era, messages were past how, how families were doing uh, via that, those kinds of networks. So communication amongst, as a community, even in a Kampala of today, which is a sort of huge, sprawling city, um, are still fairly simple. Uh, how do they... The, the invisibility I'm talking about is more in terms, at this point, but it is, it is the way that they, it's not invisibility so much as disappearing acts. Like, they, that they're not invisible to each other. Um, they're not even that invisible to, to, to Baganda society because the Baganda, Baganda society is constantly negotiating um, how, how much a part of their society these Barundi and Banyarwanda actually are. And that over a long period of time. So that goes through mechanisms like um, like defining your clan, like your, your clan history. So there are clan histories that are much closer to, to Baganda clan histories and they, their, their names are somewhat similar or they, they speak to each other, they know each other from a long time ago. Um, so that's a way of... Uh, that I'm, I'm bringing over it over to your question, which is that that's local law, local, local genealogy or customary law. Um, that's, that's a way of, it's using that kind of law, which is not necessarily law that's, that's written up, um, that a kind of protection, that I've seen a kind of protection take place. Um, so showing kinship ties and, and, and being able to tell a story about kinship ties, which is, which is kept in the memory through customary law. Not at all using the, the, the state, state position I haven't seen it, but it's a really good question that I'll keep in mind because maybe there are. Thanks, Lisa. Um, any other questions? I have one burning question, and and maybe that should be the last one before we have some drinks. But the, my burning question is particular to Peter and and Sarah. The question I want to ask is that I really appreciate the specific and precise description of um, fields that you're providing, legal fields, and the ways in which how, in the case of Peter, judicialization of politics is playing itself out, and in the case of Sarah, you also use the reverse inverse of that politicization of the judiciary. The question I want to ask, and you can decline it in different ways, but um, in broader speaking terms, speaking broadly, is there another narrative, is there a narrative that you would fit what you're describing in terms of what is happening right now in international politics, let's say, or transnational politics, however adjective you want to use to describe the politics to which this uh, legal fields fit. Um, clearly the grand narrative and I'm not asking for a grand narrative, but the grand narrative that this, these narratives reject is uh, 
an, a, a story of imperialism and colonialism a la 19th century or 20th century. So the exercise of power in the context of a continent has moved into a different um, modality. Is there a narrative that is emerging in your work that you would use to describe that modality? Or at the moment you would say that it's too early to actually provide that kind of description? Or would you say that your work is a kind of work that even rejects identifying a narrative of that kind? It is not seeking a description that's broader than it's providing. And I hope this burning question is clear enough. I think, yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm not seeking a, a replacement or large narrative, so I can say that. I mean, there's all. I think what I'm saying is, is all things are pushing in different directions here. And one other way, one way of describing what's going on here is in southern Africa that you're starting, there's a serious push for something like a national legal order staffed by national judges. But it's using, one of the ways that happens is through tra the transnationalization of legal education, the weakness, this slow, gradual weakening of the Commonwealth links. So moving beyond the Commonwealth links to some other link, like US legal education, makes it possible to nationalize the judiciary for the first time. Um, whereas previously, I met the only country in the region which had really done something about the colonial inheritance had been South Africa under apartheid. And that was an astonishing state-led effort to cut ties with colonial power, including translating legal textbooks into Afrikaans. Um, in fact, the guy who wrote the first Afrikaans legal textbook became Chief Justice, the most notorious of the war under apartheid Stein. And there was a huge state-led effort to do that. Now what we're seeing in, South Africa, in Southern Africa is what globalization, in a way, is meant to not prevent from happening, which is something like the nationalization. But it's happening thanks to the genuine transnationalization of the legal opportunities for different lawyers. So I'm resolutely not telling a bigger story. Okay? That's yeah, I would I would tend to say the same. That um, like in, in, in the past years, I've been more and more influenced by historians rather than political scientists, and particularly people like Frederick Cooper or others who have had the capacity throughout their careers, so obviously we're, talk, we're talking about people who are in their 50s, 60s, or 70s sometimes, so with the hindsight of having achieved decades of research, which is actually not my case, um, and who look at history as a kind of like revolution, as, as we mentioned earlier, as not so much cycles that come back over and over again, but as a series of events tied in, like some Subramanian called, uh, talks about interconnectedness uh, in world history, basically. Um, so, a series of ways of allocating power, distribution power, and privilege, and so forth in the world that, are, that build on the past, even when they depart uh, from the past. So obviously this is not giving any sense um, or, or answer to your question, uh, but it's just a belief that one needs maturity to actually, like intellectual maturity, to actually draw an answer to that. And the takeaway message I get from those readings is a theoretical ambition of zooming in and out constantly, of not letting oneself be blinded by one particular era or the um, pressures of one particular era, but to go back, constantly go back and learn from the past. Thanks very much. With that note, so let's thank our...